Mark Twain Selected Works Traveling with the Reformer Part 2 1893 There was a murmur of applause at the conductor's compact reasoning, and it gave him pleasure. You could see it in his face. But the Major was not disturbed. He said, There. Now you have touched upon a crying defect in the complaint system. The railway officials, as the public think, and as you also seem to think, are not aware that there are any kind of insults except spoken ones. So nobody goes to headquarters and reports insults of manner, insults of gesture, look, and so forth. And yet, these are sometimes harder to bear than any words. They are bitter, hard to bear because there is nothing tangible to take hold of. And the insulter can always say, if called before the railway officials, that he never dreamed of intending any offense. It seems to me that the officials ought to specially and urgently request the public to report unworded affronts and incivilities. The conductor laughed and said, Well, that would be trimming it pretty fine, sure. But not too fine, I think. I will report this matter at New Haven, and I have an idea that I'll be thanked for it. The conductor's face lost something of its complacency. In fact, it settled to a quite sober cast, and the owner of it moved away. I said, You are not really going to bother with that trifle, are you? It isn't a trifle. Such things aren't always to be reported. It is a public duty, and no citizen has a right to shirk it. But I shan't have to report this case. Why? It won't be necessary. Diplomacy will do the business, you'll see. Presently, the conductor came on his rounds again, and when he reached the major, he leaned over and said, That's all right. You needn't report him. He's responsible to me, and if he does it again, I'll give him a talking to. The Major's response was cordial. Now that is what I like. You mustn't think that I was moved by any vengeful spirit, for that wasn't the case. It was duty, just a sense of duty. That was all. My brother-in-law is one of the directors of the road, and when he learns that you are going to reason with your brakeman the very next time he brutally insults an unoffending old man, it will please him. You may be sure of that. The conductor did not look as joyous as one might have thought he would, but on the contrary, it looked sickly and uncomfortable. He stood around a little and said, I think something ought to be done to him now. I'll discharge him. Discharge him? What good would that do? Don't you think it would be better wisdom to teach him better ways and keep him? Well, there's something in that. What would you suggest? He insulted the old gentleman in presence of all these people. How would it do to have him come and apologize in their presence? I'll have him here right off, and I want to say this. If people would do as you've done and report such things to me, instead of keeping mum and going off and black out in the road, you'd see a different state of things pretty soon. How much obliged to you. The brakeman came and apologized. After he was gone, the major said, Now you see how simple and easy that was. The ordinary citizen would have accomplished nothing. The brother-in-law of a director can accomplish anything he wants to. But are you really the brother-in-law of a director? Always. Always, when the public interests require it. I have a brother-in-law on all the boards, everywhere. It saves me a world of trouble. It is a good wide relationship. 
Yes, I have over 300 of them. Is the relationship never doubted by a conductor? I have never met with a case. It is the honest truth I never have. Why didn't you let him go ahead and discharge the brakeman in spite of your favorite policy? You know he deserved it. The major answered with something which really had a sort of distant resemblance to impatience. If you would stop and think a moment, you wouldn't ask such a question as that. Is a brakeman a dog that nothing but dog's methods will do for him? He is a man and has a man's fight for life. And he always has a sister or a mother or wife and children to support. Always. There are no exceptions. When you take his living away from him, you take theirs away too. And what have they done to you? Nothing. And where is the profit in discharging an uncourteous brakeman and hiring another just like him? It's unwisdom. Don't you see that the rational thing to do is to reform the brakeman and keep him? Of course it is. Then he quoted with admiration the conduct of a certain division superintendent of the Consolidated Road in a case where a switchman of two years' experience was negligent once and threw a train off the track and killed several people. Citizens came in a passion to urge the man's dismissal, but the superintendent said, No, you are wrong. He has learned his lesson. He will throw no more trains off the track. He is twice as valuable as he was before. I shall keep him. We had only one more adventure on the trip. Between Hartford and Springfield, the train boy came shouting in with an armful of literature and dropped a sample into a slumbering gentleman's lap, and the man woke up with a start. He was very angry, and he and a couple of friends discussed the outrage with much heat. They sent for the parlor car conductor and described the matter, and were determined to have the boy expelled from his situation. The three complainants were wealthy Holyoke merchants, and it was evident that the conductor stood in some awe of them. He tried to pacify them and explain that the boy was not under his authority, but under that of one of the news companies. But he accomplished nothing. Then the major volunteered some testimony for the defense. He said, I saw it all. You gentlemen have not meant to exaggerate the circumstances, but still that is what you have done. The boy has done nothing more than all trained boys do. If you want to get his way softened down and his manners reformed, I am with you and ready to help. But it isn't fair to get him discharged without giving him a chance. But they were angry and would hear of no compromise. They were well acquainted with the president of the Boston and Albany, they said, and would put everything aside next day and go up to Boston and fix that boy. The major said he would be on hand, too, and would do what he could to save the boy. One of the gentlemen looked him over and said, Apparently it is going to be a matter of who can wield the most influence with the president. Do you know Mr. Bliss personally? The Major said with composure. Yes, he is my uncle. The effect was satisfactory. There was an awkward silence for a minute or more, then the hedging and the half-confessions of overhaste and exaggerated resentment began, and soon everything was smooth and friendly and sociable and it was resolved to drop the matter and leave the boy's bread and butter unmolested. It turned out as I had expected. The president of the road was not the major's uncle at all, except by adoption and for this day and train only. We got into no episodes on the return journey. Probably it was because we took a night train and slept all the way. We left New York Saturday night by the Pennsylvania Road. 
After breakfast the next morning, we went into the parlor car, but found it a dull place and dreary. There were but few people in it and nothing going on. Then we went into the little smoking compartment of the same car and found three gentlemen in there. Two of them were grumbling over one of the rules of the road, a rule which forbade card playing on the trains on Sunday. They had started an innocent game of high-low jack and been stopped. The major was interested. He said to the third gentleman, Did you object to the game? Not at all. I am a Yale professor and a religious man, but my prejudices are not extensive. Then the major said to the others, You are at perfect liberty to resume your game, gentlemen. No one here objects. One of them declined the risk, but the other one said he would like to begin again if the major would join him. So they spread an overcoat over their knees and the game proceeded. Pretty soon the parlor conductor arrived and said brusquely, There, there, gentlemen, that won't do. Put up the cards. It's not allowed. The major was shuffling. He continued to shuffle and said, by whose order is it forbidden? It's my order. I forbid it. The dealing began. The major asked, Did you invent the idea? What idea? The idea of forbidden card playing on Sunday. No, of course not. Who did? The company. Then it isn't your order after all, but the company's. Is that it? Yes, but you don't stop playing. I have to require you to stop playing immediately. Nothing is gained by hurry. And often, much is lost. Who authorized the company to issue such an order? My dear sir, that is a matter of no consequence to me. But you forget that you are not the only person concerned. It may be a matter of consequence to me. It is indeed a matter of very great importance to me. I cannot violate a legal requirement of my country without dishonoring myself. I cannot allow any man or corporation to hamper my liberties with illegal rules, a thing which railway companies are always trying to do, without dishonoring my citizenship. So... I come back to that question. By whose authority has the company issued this order? I don't know. That's their affair. Mine, too. I doubt if the company has any right to issue such a rule. This road runs through several states. Do you know what state we are in now and what its laws are in matters of this kind? Its laws do not concern me, but the company's orders do. It is my duty to stop this game, gentlemen, and it must be stopped. Possibly. But still, there is no hurry. In hotels, they post certain rules in the rooms, but they always quote passages from the state law as authority for these requirements. I see nothing posted here of this sort. Please produce your authority and let us arrive at a decision, for you see yourself that you are marring the game. I have nothing of the kind, but I have my orders, and that is sufficient. They must be obeyed. Let us now jump to conclusions. It will be better all around to examine into the matter without heat or haste and see just where we stand before either of us makes a mistake. For the curtailing of the liberties of a citizen of the United States is a much more serious matter than you and the railroads seem to think, and it cannot be done in my person until the curtailer proves his right to do so. Now, my dear sir, will you put down those cards?